everyone, I'm here with Dr. James Merritt, who is the founding pastor at Cross Point Church in Duluth, Georgia, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and preaches over a quarter of a million people each week on his broadcast ministry, Touching Lives. Dr. Merritt, first of all, thanks for being here today and uh, just being willing to talk about what the Bible says about character. Chad, great to be with you. You're one of my boys, as you know. Uh, hated to lose you to Mississippi. It was our, our loss and their gain, and I'm excited about where you are, but I can tell you, you are still sorely missed over here, especially by this guy right here. Well, hey, I miss you guys as well, but uh, I did want to talk to you a little bit about character, and I know you recently wrote a book called Character Still Counts. You know, we hear the word character sometimes synonymously with integrity. Before we go into uh, really the details of your book, how would you best define the word character? It's a great question. You know, Chad, let me go ahead and say, uh, jump into one thing I think we're going to talk about anyway. Um, there, there's a big emphasis, unfortunately, today on reputation as opposed to character. Uh, you're not old enough to remember, probably, but there was a great tennis player named Andre Agassi back in the day. We used to do commercials for Kodak, and, and, which is now our business, but they did, it was one of the most effective ads ever done, and their theme was image is everything. <laughs> and we see that now, Chad, whether it's in the pastorate or in politics, whether it's in Hollywood or Wall Street, image is everything. What you look like on the outside, you know, so, you know, plastic surgery is booming and, you know, health gyms are full, filled with people wanting to work out, look their best. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But, but so, you know, the difference between character and reputation very simply is reputation is what people think you are. Character is what you and God know that you are. And so the way I define character, and of course, there's good character and bad character. We're assuming it's good character. I believe that character, in my opinion, and I don't think you can leave God out of it, Character, if I could put it as simply as I know how, is Jesus in action. Uh, I'm, I'll go ahead and jump, Chad. The last chapter of the book is my favorite chapter uh, because I, 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 it's all about Jesus. And I point out how every character trait that I talk about in the book, Jesus lived out perfectly. He was the perfect character. So that's what I would say, uh, and that's a theological term, but I really mean it that way. Character is Jesus in action. Give us a little bit more of a broader perspective on what the Bible says about character. What, what are maybe some of your go-to scriptures and uh, Bible stories? Obviously, you mentioned Jesus, but uh, I think from a broader perspective, you know, character is a biblical theme. So talk to us about that. No question. As a matter of fact, if you go to Proverbs, uh, Sol uh, Solomon actually uses the word, and he talks about character repeated. does it in Ecclesiastes. Uh, I was just reading Isaiah this morning in my quiet time, and, and Isaiah talked about character. Um, Chad, the thing I would say, if, if you think about it, one of the reasons why when you read the Bible, you should fall in love with God, and you should have faith in God, and you should totally trust God, is because the Bible reveals the character of God. Character is more important to God than anything else, because that's what we all really are at the end of the day. So, so God's character, of course, God is holy, God is gracious, God is compassionate, God is kind, God is truthful. And so, uh, you know, I, I just think character, frankly, pervades the entire thing. I, here's a good example. You, you go to Genesis chapter uh, 1 and 2 and 3. God puts his character on the line with Adam and Eve when he puts them in a perfect garden, Chad, perfect garden gives them all these trees to enjoy and all the fruit and all of the, you know, all of this wonderful, lavish garden they're in. And he simply says, don't eat of that one tree. In the day you eat of it, of it you will surely die. What happened? Bottom line is this. They doubted God's character. Mm -hmm. They said, they convinced themselves, either he's keeping something from us that he doesn't want us to have, so he's holding out, so they doubted his character there. Or they said, nah, he won't kill us. He loves us too much. He's not really telling the truth. So you don't even get out of the first three chapters of Genesis that God is not displaying character and putting it on the line. So it literally permeates all of Scripture. Yeah, I like how you connected our character and the character of God. You know, sometimes I think we distinguish the two because God is so 
you know, he's so holy that we don't, you know, compare ourselves with that, but the importance that our character should flow from his character. I, I want to talk about how character influences or the lack thereof. I know we're in the middle of a national pandemic. There's civil, there's uh, racial unrest. Uh, there's obviously a presidential election. Uh, we're right in the middle of the uh, Republican National Convention. We actually heard this morning on the news this morning about Jerry Falwell Jr., the scandal at Liberty University. I don't know if you're a prophet, but this book you wrote, uh, I mean, it is prophetic in this season. Um, how, how, how do you think our world would change, Dr. Merritt, if, if we became men and women of character? Well, let me just tell you, this is the book, by the way, Character Still Counts, Chad, and uh, you got a copy of it, of course. Um, let me just do this. As, as you lead your people on Wednesday night, let me just read <clears throat> the character traits that I list out in the book. And I would ask your people right now, think about how our country, how our, how our world, how our politics, <clears throat> how our discourse with each other, how our neighborly relationships, how would they be different, Chad, if everyone, if everybody in the world, everybody in our nation especially, every day practice the following, integrity, <clears throat> honesty, humility, loyalty, respect, authenticity, generosity, courage, perseverance, self-control, forgiveness, faithfulness. I mean, first of all, let me go ahead and say to those that either get the book or read the book, uh, it was one of the hardest books I ever read because, Chad, I don't live up to all of those all the time. I'll be the first one to tell you, it's a very self-convicting book. But I can tell you, and, and I'm going to state the obvious, how different our nation would be, how different our country would be, how much the political rancor would go down today if just whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, a Libertarian, an Independent, whatever you might be, if you said, I'm going to live a life of integrity and honesty and humility and respect, what would happen? What, what, look, think about the transformation, Chad, that would take place in every single area of our life. It'd be incredible. Yeah. I, you know, I, I remember you saying that this was one of the, well, in fact, the hardest book you've ever worked on. Uh, and you've written a number of different books and and how uh, how guilty it makes us all feel when we read it. And, you know, when you go down that list of characteristics, it doesn't matter if you lean left or lean right politically. It, it's an equal opportunity offender. Right. And, yeah. uh, I know you mentioned even in the book some character flaws of uh, politicians in the past, uh, you know, from Clinton to Trump. How, how does character or the lack of character at the top of a country, an organization, or a church, how does that flow down to the to the leadership, or maybe middle management, or the layman, the everyday person? How does that flow down? How does that influence uh, a country, or a church, or an organization? You know, that's a great question. In fact, um, uh, I love my opening quote uh, in the introduction, the title, "The Character Don't Leave Home Without It." <laughs> it's funny, but it's 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 also not funny. Charles Barkley, I was going to sue for defamation of character, but then I realized I have no character. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's funny, but it's not funny. Yeah. And so let, let, me, let me just say it to you this way. Chad, every person of influence is a role model. Every person. If you are a mother of only one child, you're a role model to that child. If you are a owner of a small business, and let's say, Chad, you only own three employees, you only ha have three employees, you pay their salary, they're depending on you, you are their quote unquote boss. Chad, you're a role model for them. You have influence, you're a role model. And, and it really, really irritates me when I hear these athletes and other people sometimes say, well, I'm no role model. No, if you have influence, Chad, you're a role model. You don't get that choice. The choice you make is, am I gonna be a good role model or a bad role model. And so I, I think that beginning, whether you're the president of the United States, you're a United States senator, you're a congressman, you're an Oscar-winning actor or actress, 
Uh, you are the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You're, you command a battalion in the army. You're the principal of a school. You're the pastor of a, of a, of a small or a large church. Or if you just literally have one person that answers to you in a business, you have to realize how important character is. Character is not so much taught as it's caught. It really is true, Chad. What we, what we do speaks a lot louder than what we say. And I'm not here at all to pick on anybody. You brought up Jerry Falwell Jr. I used to be on the board at Liberty University. I knew Dr. Falwell very well. I know you, Jerry, not as well as I knew his dad, but I knew Jerry. I resigned from the board quite a few years ago for a number of reasons, but I was on the board when Jerry took over for his dad. I, was, I attended the first board meeting that Jerry was, was, was over. Um, Jerry Falwell, and again, I, don't, I, 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 I hurt for him. Uh, I, my heart's broke for him, his wife, his family. It's a tragedy for everybody. Nobody's lose, nobody wins, everybody loses. But here's a great example of how character will catch up with you. Good character will save you in a bad time. Bad character cannot save you even in a good time. And so uh, I believe that character really does flow from one person to another, and it does flow down, and it very is important. And I, I just believe that character still counts. It always has, and it always will. Yeah, I like what you said. Character is more caught than taught. And uh, I have somewhat of an insider perspective because I was a part of your staff for seven years. One of the things that you do uh, with your staffers when they come on board, you give them a sword. I want you to talk a little bit about that. You know, it's, a, it's like a medieval sword that you give that staffer and you talk about honor and dignity and uh, talk a little bit more about the sword. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, when, we, when we bring new staffers on, new staff people on, we, we you know, give them a sword. And we got this from an idea from a treat we did years ago. And, and what I give is a sword, and, and I let them know, okay, we're all apart. We're kind of knights around. We're kind of the knights of the round table. And um, we're a team. And the one thing that we should, there's, there's three things we should always be able to count on from each other. Honesty, integrity, and hard work. I expect you to do your job. We'll never lie to each other. And we'll always have each other's back. And that's what that sword represents. We'll always have each other's back. So uh, I, I just think, Chad, you know, there, there are three parts while we're on this, Chad. And, you know, we've talked about this before. When, when, you're, when anybody, and this is true in your pastor of a church or run a business, there are three things you have to make sure you've got nailed down before you hire anybody. I call it the three C's, character, competency, and chemistry. You can teach competency. You can try to work with chemistry. They either have character or they don't. They're not going to, if they don't have character before they come on your staff, they probably don't have it after they come on your staff. And, and so uh, what, 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 the reason I, I, when I bring staff on is I simply let them know what I ask, I give. And so I say to them, if, if you do something great or we do something great, I'll do everything I can to give you the glory for it. If we mess up, I'll do everything I can to take the heat. But what I will promise you is this. Don't ever lie to me. Work hard, give me your best. And then, no matter what you do that may be, you, what, no matter how bad you may mess up or foul up, I will have your back. Now, we may need to deal with, we may need to deal with something in private. I'm not talking about something immoral. We may need to deal with something in private. But if you do your best and, and then something goes wrong and I need to deal with it, I'll deal with you privately. I will not broach criticism of you behind your back. You can always trust me to be loyal to you. And that's why, Chad, I don't you know, say this to brag, but you worked with me for, what, seven or eight years, so I mean, you can vouch for it. I, I don't know of anybody out there today, there may be, I don't know, that's ever served with me that said, man, don't work with that guy. Uh, I've never had that happen. I, I work hard to be the kind of person I want people to work with and be able to say, now, you know me, Chad, I've got a lot of faults. You know them. You know how far short I fall in some of these areas myself. I'm not, I don't mind admitting that. But you can say, you know, having worked with me, for example, you know what, Doc? You know, you give the sword out, but you hold the sword as well. What you ask for, you give. And, I, and that's, so we found it's been very, very helpful. And by the way, Chad, it almost moves the curve down the field for a new staff member. It, it, it takes away a lot of nervousness. How is it going to be to work here? You know, do I have to walk on eggshells? Nope. Be honest. You know this. We get 
honest feedback. You can say what you want to say. You, you know, give it your best shot. Do your job and be loyal, and we'll get along great. Yeah, I think the interesting part looking back at uh, my time with you is uh, it, it was a very unique experience. And we would get in a room, and you encouraged uh, personal discourse, public de debate. And, you know, it would get heated at times. But at the end of the day, when we walked out of the room, we knew that we were, we were going to respect each other, support each other, and we have each other's back. Exactly. And that's what the sword was all about. And, 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 and Chad, to your point, you saw it. Our staff got along great. We got along great. And we, to your point, we walked out. You're right. We got heated. You saw me get heated. We get heated. It's like a family, right? You get heated at times. But at the end of the day, when a decision is made, it's a decision we all made together. It's a decision we all support together. We've made it. We're moving on now. And then we go out and eat a hamburger and, and go play top golf and have a great day. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, talk to us a little bit about, because I know as an evangelical Christian, I feel torn as a pastor. And I can't imagine how everyone else feels torn. And uh, I want to talk about character and politics, because we have a presidential election that, that's coming up. And uh, I think if we're honest, we see really duplicitous actions from both sides of political uh, spectrums. What recommendation would you give any Christian on, uh, you know, before they go to the, the booth on, uh, in November, it, what, what's your recommendation to them related to this issue of character and voting? Well, um, and I want to, this is a, you know, you warned me, you're going to ask me this question. <laughs> um, I, you know, I want to, I want to tiptoe through the tulips here because on the one hand, uh, it doesn't matter to me whether you've got people in your church that vote. We, and, you know, we do in our church. i got Republicans. I've got Democrats. i got Libertarians. I've got Independents. I mean, I've, you know, we're 41% minority in our church. So, uh, you know, over the years, I've seen Obama stickers. I've seen McCain stickers. I've seen Bush stickers. Uh, I've seen Kerry stickers. I've seen Hillary Clinton stickers. I've seen Donald Trump stickers. I've seen it all. And so, you know, I've had to, to lead our church on how to navigate. So let me just say the first thing. This would be the first thing I'd say before we get into more specifics. I think the biggest mistake people are making today, and it's a bad one. I, I have a motto, Chad. I never make the political personal. Never. We've got people today, if you say I'm voting for Trump, there are people out there, they just shut you down. They look at you like, you know, you're a communist. Same thing on the other side. If you tell somebody you're voting for Biden, boom, that's it, done. I mean, veins pop out of necks, eyes bulge out, voices are raised, people get hot, friendships are broken. I think that's ridiculous. Politics is politics. That's what makes politics so fascinating. Everybody's got their own political view, but I've never yet seen why or that politics should divide a friendship. You can just agree to disagree. You want to vote for candidate A, I'm not, I'm going to vote for candidate B. I'm going to vote for candidate B, I'm not going to vote for candidate A, or I'm going to write in somebody. Fine. Here's the thing I would say. Number one, I do believe, for me, character still counts. I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat. I don't care what you're going to do about the Supreme Court, taxes, the economy, or foreign policy. Character still counts for me. Now, having said that, what I say to everybody are two things. Number one, everybody should vote. And I mean that. It, it, even Let's say you're going to vote, Chad, for the candidate I would not support. And I knew I could talk you out of voting. I wouldn't do that. I'd say, Chad, you, are, you have a civic and I think a, a Christian responsibility to vote. You ought to go vote. Everybody ought to vote. Now, and I'm adamant about the second thing. If you do not vote, you lose the right to criticize. Don't gripe and complain. You don't like what's going on. If you didn't vote, you had a chance to exercise your voice. You didn't do it. I don't want to hear it. Third thing. This is the last thing. The thing to keep in mind is this about voting. I don't have to answer for the way you vote. You don't have to answer for the way I vote. But we will all answer for the way we voted. You better just keep that in mind when you go into that voting booth. That's what I would say. Yeah, that, that certainly raises the level of tension in, in our own hearts because I've observed that oftentimes people allow their politics to shape their biblical worldview. They don't allow the Bible to shape their political worldview. 
And I think uh, sometimes we have the cart before the horse here. But anyway, Doc, thanks so much for being here with us. Uh, I, I love the book. I think the book would be great for any kind of a leader who is uh, maybe they're leading an organization. Uh, maybe they're leading, uh, you know, in the church. It's, it's a good resource just to take your staff through to say, hey, these are biblical characteristics that, uh, that we can be a healthier organization in general. Yeah. With that, Doc, do you, would you mind praying just for us, praying for our country? Yes, uh, you know, typically, this is uh, the, the night we pray uh, just for a revival and awakening. And uh, I know you are a, a man of prayer. Um, and maybe before you even do that, just quickly share with us how, how you pray for our country. How do you pray for our leaders? How do you pray uh, for revival? Yeah, uh, Chad, I pray specifically every Thursday for the president, for the vice president, for uh, my senators, for my congressman, for my mayor in Duluth. I pray for police officers. By the way, I pray for um, the Republican leader of the Senate and the Democratic leader of the Senate. I pray for the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, I, I'm, um, I'm a bipartisan prayer. And so, uh, and then I pray for spiritual awakening on Thursday. I pray for uh, people are running for political office, uh, whether I'm supporting them or not, people that could affect my life and my, my family's life. Uh, I pray for them. And so I, I do pray for them. And let me just say before I pray, thank you again, Chad, for the opportunity. I had a, had a great time. It's great to see you again. I'm counting the days when uh, the Bulldogs, my Georgia Bulldogs, come over and whip up on those rebels. And I get to come, and I've already invited myself. I'll warn your people. I've already invited myself to come preach for you. And I'll be spending the night at your home, and we're going to be going to the Ole Miss Georgia game whenever that finally comes, hopefully. Can't wait. But yeah, but one last aside, your people may not know, Chad. I used to pastor in Mississippi in Laurel at Highland Baptist Church, so I love the state of Mississippi. It has a special place in my heart. You have a special place in my heart. Give my best to Kelly and those two beautiful boys, and uh, let me pray for us right now, Chad. Yeah. Lord, um, I love this young man. I love his wife. I love his family. It was a great honor for us to serve with him. Uh, this church has a great young pastor, and I pray that they'll realize the jewel that they have, and I pray they'll realize uh, how they need to support him and lift his arms up in prayer and get behind him. They've got great, 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 the greatest days of this church will be ahead of them under the leadership of Chad Logan. Lord, I do pray for our nation. Uh, Lord, we're in trouble. Our, our biggest trouble is not the disease called COVID. Our biggest problem is the depravity called sin. Mm -hmm. Lord, we need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. So, Lord, I just pray a blessing on our nation. I pray a special blessing of favor on Chad and on his church and on his ministry. Thank you again for all he means to me and to my life, and I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.